Hello friends, I'm Kayla and I'm a big fan of libraries. Some people, my husband, might say too big a fan because I have been known to come home with a huge stack of library books and then not get to any of them and just have to return them. Clearly it's not enough that I have like 300 books on my physical TBR already, but I also get excited about all the books I see on the shelves at the library. So I reserve them, I don't read them, and then I give them back. Which is like great for the library ecosystem, I think, as long as I'm giving them back promptly. And I have read a good chunk of them. I think of the 140 books that I've read so far this year, 40 to 50 have come from the library. But I've also reserved maybe... I don't know, 20 to 40 more and then not read them. So I thought what I would do today is give myself a week to read as many library books as I can of the ones that I've already reserved and given back this year without reading. It was only recently that I even realized you could see your entire borrowing history, or at least I can, on my library website. It says I have checked out 380 items. What is that ever? I don't know. I have not looked through here thoroughly, so I thought we would do that together and I would pick a bunch to re-reserve and then read them. So let's actually just start with January and we will backtrack. So we'll go through everything that I've borrowed. I'll tell you if I read it or not. So uh, Life from Uncommon Stars, I borrowed for a video. I read the first chapter, didn't like it and returned it. Mary I read and every morning the way gets home longer and longer I read. Kiss her once for me read. A girl's a half form thing, unlikely animals. I read those. Next I see the roughest draft, which I reserved thinking I would get to read it among all of these other books, which mostly I read for the video where I was reading booktuber favorites. I think it was um, Haley Pham who we had five, four or five books in common. And this was the book I thought I would get to read for her. And then I realized that one of her books didn't actually count because I had read a different one from that author. It was embarrassing. I didn't include it in the video. So The Roughest Draft is the first one on our potential list. I read The Girls I've Been. I read Fina, Radical Acceptance, Know My Name. I didn't read These Fleeting Shadows, though I borrowed it because of the booktuber favorites video and then just picked something else from uh, Lexi's list. We'll toss that up as an option though I did read the first chapter of it and wasn't super into it. Next is a funny one. It's called A Mango Shaped Space and I borrowed this one because Liam was reading it in school and I was thinking it would be fun to read it like at the same time as him or just to see what he was excited about because he actually like recommended it to me which was cute. So that is definitely at the top of my list. Memorial I didn't finish again for the book tour favorites because I picked another book from that creator. Um, Astrid Parker I read. Oh Man Made Monsters. That's definitely one that I think I do still want to read. It's gotten mixed ratings since I reserved it and gave it back. I read Africa Risen, A Perilous Undertaking, even though I knew the end. Oh, I also got the audiobook CD I forgot of Man Made Monsters and gave it back too. Bliss Montage I DNF'd after three stories of five, which was nuts. Read that, I read that, read that. Partners in Crime, that one's tough because I did borrow it and return it and not read it and I still actively want to read it. And then I saw it on sale at the bookstore and I just bought myself a physical copy, which I told myself I was not gonna do with romance. That's where we're at. We've got Strega, ID, and Aft, How to Live Safely, I read A History of Fear. I was just interested in that, so I borrowed it and then didn't have time for it in my TBR. And then there was actually a video where I could have fit it into my TBR, but didn't, reading Paul Tremblay's blurbed books. So we'll add that one to the list. Um, read that, read that, read that. I'm doing well so far. ID and Aft, the regional office is under attack. I borrowed the violence just for a photo. Same with Molly Southbourne. I read Our Share of Night. I didn't read The Black House because nobody told me if it was good or not. <laughs> I think I actually, in one of my hauls this year, did a little mini library haul in the hall and was like, somebody just tell me if this is good. And like, nobody said anything about it. So I gave it back. Tell Me Pleasant Things About Immortality was one that I just really loved the cover. And so I borrowed it. And I don't think I read even the first chapter. I don't even remember what it's about. Oh wait, I think it's short stories actually. So that's a potential. I read The World Gives Way, Red Set on You. I borrowed The Stars Undying for something. I can't remember what it was. And then my friend Erin had it as her book club pick. And so I was like, okay, maybe I'll read it for that. And then I still didn't. This Might Hurt I DNF'd. I read Just Work, read Big Swiss, Shipped, The Soulmate Equation, Half a Soul. The Woman in the Library, I think I will read, but it's gonna be in a different video. I read Giovanni's Room. I read Pew, Feed Them Silence. House of Cotton was one I accidentally borrowed because I had reserved it so long ago and then I bought myself a copy before I actually got this. Anyway, The Witch and the Tsar, I didn't end up needing to read. I borrowed it as a potential backup pick for the same video that I read, The Wolf and the Wood 
woodsman in lies we sing to the sea i borrowed and then i looked at the goodreads and everybody like hated it <laughs> i also didn't read the thick and the lean but i borrowed that one i don't know if i'm super interested in that one at this point it's so much bigger than i thought it would be i borrowed my book club pick i borrowed the infinite black top and then realized it was part of a series and then dnf that series i read an unkindness of ghosts the worst best man the fiance farce was a hard one because i borrowed it and then people told me it was like way more serious and sad than i would have been expecting the bandit queens i also dnf'd um ascension i read the god of endings that's one that i've just heard a couple people mention and they said it was a little bit weird and so i borrowed it and then gave it back <laughs> so those are all the books that i need to now re-reserve and give a proper try but also i have three books currently out from the library <laughs> And if I don't read them now, they will end up on this list of ones that I borrowed and returned. So I think I will also give a go to Look Closer by David Ellis, which like everybody I've seen has said the exact same thing about it. Like it's a really solid four star mystery, but it's just too long. Then a brand new release, The Late Americans, that I'm just excited to read. And then I borrowed Unlikable Female Characters. I think I was the first one to get this actually. So that makes me feel like I should absolutely get to it before I give it to somebody else. To sum up, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't really know what I'm reading, <laughs> but I will pull out the camera again once I actually start reading, whatever it ends up being. All right, all the holds are in, or back in rather. Here's the ones I already had. Then we got The God of Endings. They had The Stars Undying, The Black House, Man-Made Monsters, A Mango-Shaped Space, Tell Me Pleasant Things About Immortality, and A History of Fear. The ones I didn't read reserve were the romance that I've kind of changed my mind about or I'll read in a different video, but then ones I couldn't get promptly. So I think if I read five out of these 10 in the next week, I'll consider that a success. Liam and I had a really fun day out. We went to the arcade and there's like mini golf there and go-karts and batting cages. So we did mini golf. I beat him um, by two points, thank you very much. And then we did the batting cages and he hit like every ball and I hit one. It was very scary in there. We played some games, it was really fun. And then we got Slurpees. And so I thought today, since we were hanging out, was a perfect day to start A Mango Shaped Space by Wendy Mass. I picked this up from the library when he was reading it with his class and I forgot I got like a third of the way in and then I had to give it back. That's what happened with this one. So I think this is the book that Liam learned about synesthesia. Please tell me this cat does not die. Liam, tell me this cat does the, not die. The very end. I'm sorry. Why would you recommend me this book? I'm halfway through and they're talking about how Mango's like not feeling well and like hiding and like has to go to the vet. And I'm like, the reason the cat's name is Mango isn't because it's like mango colored. It's because um, she, synesthesia. it's the synesthesia. And so when she hears the cat meow, she sees like the color of Mango. And I think that's so cute. Anyway, so while I had heard of synesthesia before, I never really thought about it as like a really disruptive thing, I guess, because the people that I'd seen kind of mention it, it was how more heightened things felt. So when they saw numbers and letters, they associate a color with it. And it was always like this fun thing that, hey, what's my name? Like, if you could see a color for my name, like what's my name? But what Mia is describing to us is how difficult it is for her to say, take a math test because she, when she looks at the numbers she associates them with certain colors and gets distracted and when there's loud noises she sees like shoots she, color shooting everywhere and she can't get things done and she can't focus she's 13 years old so I think that's super cool that Liam was reading about a same age protagonist and she also was talking about like Liam is in language class uh, that just started recently and she is taking Spanish and she's talking about how difficult it is for her to figure out different languages because to her the word friend has always had an association with turquoise she sees turquoise when she sees the word friend so when she's trying to translate amigo amigo the word comes across to her as yellow and so she can't connect the two things so she's going through this journey in the book of explaining this to her parents and her parents getting her a diagnosis and her sharing with her friends and it's the similar experience that a lot of protagonists this age have when they're sharing certain issues or identity stuff with their friends and their family is they always get the responses from friends that are like, 
why didn't you trust me with this sooner? I can't believe you hid this from me. And then the parents like may not believe the child and say things like, well, why didn't you tell us about this before? Are you looking for attention? So that's obviously a really common experience people can relate to in this book while also learning about synesthesia. I'm halfway through now and she has found somebody who understands what synesthesia is. She's there explaining it to her as it's like, you know, wires kind of being misplaced and sight and sound could get mixed up and then they find her uh, connecting to this forum with other people who are dealing with it. And she's connecting with different people for the first time and feeling like misunderstood by people in her real life, but she has this new community and now is that new community taking too much of her time. Once you find the people who really understand you, it's like hard to not let that take over your entire life, especially when you're young and impressionable and just getting on the internet for the first time, there's like a community for you. You can find anybody that you are looking to connect with who has something in common with you. And so it's hard for her to not neglect real life relationships and her schoolwork. And now we're on that journey with her. I think it's really good so far. I'm now done with it and I'm not giving it a rating because it's a middle grade. I feel like it would be in the mid range though. Like this isn't the best thing that I've ever read, even within this age category. I wouldn't hesitate to recommend it probably. I'm fine slash happy with Liam having read it. I mean, at this age, anything that gets your attention enough to finish the book, that's a win. Looking at Goodreads, I've really seen a mix of people um, saying that they didn't like the representation in here. And then also people with synesthesia saying that they enjoyed the representation, even though it seems the author herself does not. The collective agreement though seems to be that it is over dramatized in good ways and bad ways. It's not as like life changing and beautiful and wild colors as much as it portrays. And it's also not the most debilitating thing for the majority of people. Naturally also everybody's reactions in the book are a little bit over the top, not really realistic, but I think that's fine. I don't know that the consequences always matched uh, what was going on in here. Like at one point she goes for acupuncture, like a medical, like needles entering her body without her parents' knowledge, without the adult who took her or the medical professionals like needing any type of proper consent from a guardian. Exactly what Meg Cabot said on the cover funny and touching. I laughed out loud once. I felt sad once, but then also the ending like brings it full circle and like pet related and it's very sweet. And I think the point of the book is accomplished. She gets what she needs. She finds a way to work with her synesthesia instead of against it in school settings. I could have done without probably like the crushes and the kissing and the weird like love triangle that happened. It was just for a second, but I don't know quite what the goal was with introducing that. And so now my first book is done and I can move on to something else. Hello, good morning. We're at the park. We just did some baseball. Liam is currently mountain biking in some trails over here. And I have read the first three stories of this. So tell me pleasant things about immortality. I think was originally on my radar because it's a Vancouver author. I think that's correct. And um, I heard that the stories were weird and similar to like cursed bunny. So the first story was just like this family eating dinner together. There were some confessions involved. I gave it a four. The second story had to do with this like old nasty woman and she was immortal. She was like 300 years old and her body was like disintegrating and all the descriptions were horrific. And then it also paired with this like televised fight for immortality that everyone had to eat these flowers. It was really interesting. I would have liked to read a full length novel and I gave it five stars. I would read a full length novel if it wasn't from just the perspective of this woman because it was gnarly. Um, and then the third one was about this girl who was so ugly. Her parents were talking about eating her and they nicknamed her chicken face, which is literally what I call Liam, but they called her that because she was so ugly. And then they found this opportunity for her to marry someone because no one wants to marry her or any of the other ugly girls in this society. So they send them away. I also gave that one a four. Um, so that's where I'm at with this. It is odd and I'm liking it. Hello, good to see you. I am probably not gonna be reading much today. I need to get ready and I have a lot of work to do, but I wanna tell you my final thoughts on Tell Me Pleasant Things About Immortality because I did finish it. So get ready with me. Oh, this is leaky while I talk about it. Can I just say like, I am so tired <laughs> of my sunspots. I think it was like three summers ago, there was one single day that I didn't wear sunscreen and I got these right here and then right on my upper lip and it makes it look like I have a mustache and I don't use like a proper foundation 
that covers it up. But even when I do, I feel like you can see them like five minutes later anyway. I've been using my Rare Beauty blush recently on my under eyes just a little bit as like a color corrector. And then I actually like mixing it with my concealer on my cheeks. And I feel like it makes a better color than just this by itself over top of everything. Anyway, that's all I have to say about my makeup. Thanks for listening. Anyway, they will go away again once fall comes and I go back to being super mega pale. Right now I'm only semi mega pale. So I finished this this morning and I was gonna update you once I hit like another five star because I read all the stories that I read and I had a huge win near the beginning that you saw. And I just waited like the entire book until we got to the very end. So it took a while to get there. And the story that did it was called Sorry Sister Eunice. And it was so um, bunny coded. It was written in first person plural. It was about this group of girls. It brought in this like dark sinister tone. And then obviously it had to do with immortality. So it was just odd and interesting. I would say it is a mix of Curse Bunny by Bora Chong and Out There by Kate Folk. So I think that makes sense since I gave one of those three stars and one of them five stars that the one I just read is going to be, I think it's just under a four, it's probably a 3.75. It reminded me of a lot of people's critiques about how high we go in the dark, how the first half was stronger and then a lot of the stories just started to repeat the same kind of message. I wish maybe it wasn't so committed to the theme because every single story does have to do with immortality and I just don't know that you need 13 stories that all have like the same concept. They feel like they exist in the same kind of world. And it just got a little bit tiring as the book went on. Maybe I'm talking myself into a 3.5. There was one where their father turned into a piece of furniture and it was just like them talking about him and what their lives were like, how he decided to be this couch and like them sitting on him. There was ghosts and zombies and there was some interesting ones. I think especially the ones that had a, a really clear, um, cultural reference. I mean a lot of them obviously come from like different um, lore and storytelling that I'm sure the author has encountered throughout her life but I think the ones that were especially strong were the ones that had a clear setting in like Shanghai and talked about different people in the family and how they were interacting. And I definitely appreciate how odd they were. I went into the collection hoping for this exact vibe and I got it. It just was more about the odd um, interactions between family members and just weirdness and none of it was bad. They were all just solidly like three to four stars independently. If you loved Cursed Bunny, this one I don't think like goes as consistently grotesque as that one, um, but it's in a similar vein. So if you love that, I think I would definitely recommend this one. I love the cover so much. The mushrooms are just such a vibe. Perfectly depicts like the weirdness of the stories. So that's that on that. And I think I will see you tomorrow with my next read. We're at the pool today. I'm just about to get in with my unicorn. And I brought four books with me because I don't know what I wanna read. And I didn't bring like the fantasy or general fiction because I just don't think I have the brain capacity for those right now. I wanna read something that's just a little more, not fun because these are, like a lot of horror, but I think I just want to read something odd and interesting. So I brought Man Made Monsters, The Black House, and A History of Fear. I guess I only brought, brought three things. I left a God of Endings at home. So I'm gonna read the first chapter of these three and then decide which one I want to continue with. of a history of fear was actually more intriguing than I thought because you know right off the bat via the synopsis and the editor's note that the main character Grayson is going to be dead by the end so it's kind of like am I that interested in following this killer and the fact that the devil made him do it and that was like part of his confession if I know that he's gonna die in the end but that first chapter was super interesting he was walking down the street and he had this potential employer who I think was asking him to like go straight a memoir for him he doesn't really know what the job was but once they met up he just got this like horrible feeling and fled but he was like this isn't the last time I'm gonna meet this guy and you're reading his like confession life story and then in 
interspersed is like editor's notes of people who are doing the investigation of like what happened to him, why he killed himself, if the devil actually made him murder his roommate Liam. So I'm probably gonna give that, if I had to rate it like a nine out of 10 for intrigue, I would be down to finish this right now or at least continue. And now I'm gonna do man-made monsters. Listen, I look rough, okay? We got home from the pool. I have now continued into one of these books. It's been a couple hours. I'm so sorry. So man-made monsters, I didn't realize until I read the first story that these are short stories. If I hadn't just read a short story collection, I would probably be down for this, but that was my mistake. I'm sure it's great. Then the Black House, the first chapter, was this woman who was arriving in this town and she was just talking to everybody and meeting all of these people. I really don't know what was happening. She just arrived like at this pub and the person is going around and introducing her to every person there, like all the family she should know. And then somebody recognizes her and he's like, don't you all know this is Maggie, like little Maggie from something. I guess she used to live there and there's probably like some tragedy or mystery revolving around her family. It wasn't the most intriguing. Maybe I'd give it a six or a seven out of 10. So I have returned to a history of fear and I've read pretty deeply into it now. I really like that you're following both the man who's writing his like life story, but then also the person who is gathering his life story and talking through like what she has discovered and what he revealed and when. And so we're flashing back to different points in his life and like his relationship with his father, why he has this fear of the devil. Um, he grew up in a very religious household and his parents didn't give him very much attention. Um, his dad got sick at a certain point and he wanted to go to a prestigious school to impress him and then kind of gave up his dreams. And then he's had just like these kind of awkward encounters with people throughout his life. And the person, Daniela, who's compiling all of this stuff is talking to the people interviewing them to see what they thought of him and their experiences with him now that he has committed this crime and died. She wants to put all these pieces together of like what kind of guy he was. And everybody has an interesting perspective on him. Some people are saying fantastic things. Some people are saying things that contradict the story that he has told us. So like certain experiences from two different perspectives seem wildly different. I don't know if it's an unreliable narrator or there is like some devilish thing that is also changing his perception. But so far, Grayson is just a really interesting character to be reading from. So I'm gonna uh, go shower, I mean. <laughs> so Liam and I went on our walk this morning. Well, I go for a walk, he goes for a bike ride. I basically just follow his tire tracks until I find him and he goes up and down all the trails and then we walk back. And I actually ended up finishing A History of Fear. Highly recommend the audiobook. It's got dual narrators. It was really well done. It is one of those cases that I think I enjoyed it more listening than reading it with my eyes which is cool because it doesn't happen a lot for me lately. This book is interesting because of the category that it's in, which I think is like horror suspense. It doesn't really say in here, but it doesn't feel scary. It is like a little suspenseful, but it doesn't feel scary. Even though you're reading through some brutal events, it's more of through a cold uh, procedural kind of lens or examination kind of lens. And it is so Paul Tremblay coded. I feel like he could have written this. I feel like this is the style of book he likes to read. I weirdly have been in the mind of Paul Tremblay a lot this year, reading books from him, reading horror that he's recommended, reading books that he blurbed. This is one of the options for reading books that he blurbed. I haven't even read the blurb. A disorienting, creepy, paranoia inducing, reimagining of the devil made me do it tale. So it is a devil story. It's a kind of satanic story. It's a kind of culty story. It's a kind of ghosty story, but it doesn't really feel like you're in it. It's like you are reflecting on it. And just like I thought, knowing the ending from the beginning, it doesn't leave you that sense of unease because you know how everything's gonna end. But I will say the last like line, I think caught me a little bit off guard in a good way and moved it from my hovering like 3.75 rating to a solid four. The examination itself is just really fascinating. If Grayson committed this act, which you just objectively know from the beginning that he did, in his own words, he did. It's just like, what was the reason for it? Is he reliable? Can you believe what he's saying? And if he is making it all up, 
to what end? For what purpose? What is he trying to accomplish? This is the kind of book that I think would make for an interesting book club. Like I'm glad I didn't pick it for the literally dead book club because it doesn't really give the vibes of like solving a mystery or following a really action-packed thriller but there is so much to discuss with these in these pages and what your opinion perspective was while you read and also some like morality conversations that could come along with it and I think I will seek out some kind of live show I'm sure somebody has read this at some point and discussed it because I want to know what everybody else was thinking at certain points in the book but talking through any of that with you like anything in here would be a spoiler because you already know the key components that Grayson murdered somebody and then he took his own life and because you know that like any other elements of the plot normally I'd be able to share with you but I feel like I can't because then like what else would you have to gain by reading it yourself just know I would recommend it but not for people who are going into it hoping for a really horrifying experience for the reader because it's not that. Anyway, I'm really excited to have finished this and I'm gonna move on to, I don't know. I think I might actually return these two because they're not doing anything for me right in this moment. I actually just like five minutes ago decided that I was going to create a different video and bring back my crafting series where I listen to an audiobook and try to find a hobby. And I'm actually gonna do the audiobook for this because it's one of the only nonfiction books that I have on my radar that I really wanna read promptly and so like I will be doing it within the next couple weeks or starting it but not for this video and then I really just have three humongous books here left and a really heavy general fiction which I don't know if I'm in the mood for <laughs> look at me being a mood reader I think I've just been reading some heavy things lately that I just want to have fun but I don't know if any of these are that. So maybe I'll do the first chapter thing again. I think because it's been a minute now since I've read some dense fantasy and sci-fi, I'm a little more separated. I can do it. I think I can do it. <laughs> I'll be back in a second with my first impressions of these. Hello, I'm back. I was wrong. My mind is not prepared to take in this much new information about a whole different like system of living. I read the first chapter of The Stars Undying and I feel like I was glazed over for half of it. There's a dynasty, there was pearls. There's a princess and a maid. There's an oracle. There's a sister who stole something. And then we have a sister who's a liar, but also a prophet. No idea, I don't know. I'm not indeed ready to read that. I read the first chapter of this, The God of Endings, and I was quite intrigued. It just feels kind of gothic. It was set in 1830 something and this young girl, her entire family died. And it was talking about how they all got buried, but then people would like dig them back up to make sure they were actually dead. And then she got blamed as if there was like witchcraft involved and she like killed everyone in her family because she's the only one who survived, but it was actually um, tuberculosis. Sorry, this is the first one I read and now I can't remember what just happened. But then we're gonna flash to 1985, which I didn't realize, or 1984, and we're following Colette, who that was not the name of the girl that I met in the first chapter. How the first chapter ended is like her grandfather came when she got sick and he like brought her back from the dead or saved her from dying or whatever. And now maybe she has to have a different identity. I still don't know what the actual story is about. It just says it's about a lonely artist. She finds her life upended by the arrival of a gifted child, the return of a stalking presence from her past and her own mysteriously growing hunger for blood. So it is a vampire -y story, which I'm interested in reading. It's a little bit long. I just put in a request uh, to my library for the audiobook. So it says I have to wait a week. If it doesn't come in by the end of this week, I will probably just buy it myself on Libro, but we'll see. And then I read the first chapter of this and I think I'm gonna continue with it right now because I am interested enough. Every single person that I've seen said it's one of the best like thrillers of the year, it's just too long. And to go into it like not knowing anything. So before anybody else spoils anything for me around the internet, I wanna read it for myself. So the first chapter had this guy and he was obsessed with his like first love his name's Simon. He's currently in a marriage with Vicky. And I guess if they stay together for like 10 years, she gets a certain amount of money, like a trust fund. But he is obsessed with this woman named Lauren. And it's as if he's writing it to Lauren. He's like, I see you out of the corner of my eye. You're so beautiful. You probably don't notice me. Why would you? So I guess he's stalking her. And I have no idea what's going to come of that. But every chapter 
is bouncing all over the place before Halloween, after Halloween, May, July, the day after Halloween. Oh, we're, we also have another perspective from Jane. I have no idea what's happening, but I do like the writing style of this. So I'm gonna go with this one and then read this one by the end of the week. And that's five books and I'm happy with that. Okay, I'm calling it a night here. I feel like I made pretty good progress. I got to page 200. The chapters are really short. They're a whole bunch of POVs, which is fun to follow. And we have some characters who are married, but they both have like other things going on on the side that are messy regarding other people and money. And you're also getting to read from the perspectives of other people involved in this marriage. It took a quarter of the way through the book to get like a hook. There was a lot of setup. It was pretty slow, but it was all interesting. And I like um, like the character voices. They're all pretty distinct, but it did take a good chunk of time to really get into the story and for like a reveal to happen. And since then we've had like four different reveals. So it seems like it's gonna be a pretty fun and fast paced thriller from here. It's the kind of book that I'm taking notes on though. I wanna keep track of everybody and the relationships and their past because everybody's past is involved and I don't wanna forget whose is whose. One of the perspectives is reminding me a bit of For Your Own Good by Samantha Downing. Just the very kind of sinister vibe and a lot of internal monologue that I think if you were listening to the audiobook, you might easily not realize his internal dialogue because he is clearly responding to people like he's in the middle of a conversation and he will respond in italics for many paragraphs, but like not respond out loud. And so I feel like it might seem like he is saying these crazy things. So we've already had quite a few reveals and we have quite a few questions. I'm gonna read maybe a little bit more before bed, but I think the bulk of this will get done tomorrow. It's another restock day for the book Charm Shop. So if you're looking for a cute little bookmark made of gems and beads and such, I'm sure a good amount of these will still be available when this video goes up. Uh, day or two from now. So I just realized I said at the beginning I started editing this and I said I'm gonna read as many library books as I can in a week. The week is up tomorrow and I'm gonna stick to my consistent video schedule hopefully this month and get everything done that I want. And I've successfully completed Look Closer so I can move on today to The God of Endings. I realized I said I was gonna wait for the library um, hold to come in but I need to read it like today. So I'm gonna get it on Libro because it's not on Scribd. If you do not have a Libro FM account, I would highly suggest signing up. If you want to use my link, that helps me out. But if you don't, that's cool too. You connect it to your local indie bookstore. You pay a fee just like Audible every month. So I think that's what I will do with the last one because I do want to do it on audio. So look closer. Where do I put it? Can I just leave it here? Will it stay? I'm giving it a four and I agree with like everybody's rating out there, but I actually have seen a lot of fives as well. And I could definitely see why somebody would give it a five. If you like me read Gone Girl and it was like that kind of domestic thriller in its time that subverted certain things and got you really excited to read thrillers again. And then you also read The Kind Worth Killing and it did the same thing for you amongst this like slew of other domestic thrillers that kind of bleed together like if there have been a couple key ones for you like those two this could really be the next one for you it could just be the thrillers that i've been picking up you know thrillers have really been flopping for me the last three years i no doubt have found some five stars but in general it is hard to find ones that really hit the nail on the head and even though i'm giving this four stars it's going to be one of my top recommended ones because i think um it definitely pulls off a good plot twist i'm always looking for something that's entertaining and something that surprises me. This one surprised me. And so that's impressive on its own, but it didn't entertain me the whole time. Like, yeah, things were constantly happening. There were multiple little reveals, sure, but I wasn't like having just a ball. I found it interesting the whole time, but it wasn't the most fun thing I've ever read. But all the POVs make it super interesting because you're following like lawyers and detectives and people planning something and people solving something. And I wouldn't say for the first like two thirds of it, you get to really theorize anything on your own. It's all given to you slowly, but then you do get start to get a couple little clues and you get to think for yourself for that last third. And I definitely need that in a mystery thriller. It reminded me a bit of reading The Devotion of Suspect X, maybe just because it's more recent in my mind or maybe it's because it's one of the only 
detective focused thrillers that I've even read but this felt a little bit like that because there's some scheming going on and watching them go through their own theories is interesting and I don't often like a detective procedural. It does get more detective focused the further the book goes. And it does say right in the synopsis quite possibly the perfect murder is in these pages and there's millions and millions of dollars on the line. Like obviously everyone and anyone is going to try to get that money for themselves. So I need to do all of this. I have to take uh, my dad somewhere today. Actually I have to pick up Rob from work. I had to drive him. I've been up since six which might not sound too early to somebody. Rob's work vehicle like broke down yesterday. The brakes went out. He had to like my biggest fear. He had to pull his e-brake and like run off the road. He was going really slow. He was in traffic but he could have easily hit someone. So the point that it happened when the brakes completely went out he was really lucky the spot that he was in but then he had to wait like a really long time for the tow truck and then I had to go get him and then I had to drive him to work this morning he has to borrow someone else's vehicle now I have to go get him again I was like oh hopefully they just give you the day off of work because you don't have a vehicle and he was like no I definitely uh, need to just keep on going anyway I'll see you soon I have been making such good progress through the god of endings and I really like it I feel like it's gonna be a four I get the sense that if you read Addie LaRue, why did I just want to grab it? Well, it is right here. If you read Addie LaRue and you were like, this is about an immortal being and she's living through all of these decades and all of these years and yet we never learn about like certain things about countries and we don't really delve into conflict and whatever and see her really existing in this time and that was something that bothered you. I feel like The God of Endings is something you might really enjoy in that aspect because you get to see her really solidly in specific years and it's talking about the wars and different things going on between countries. It's interesting to me because this is a vampire kind of story and you're following her as she becomes a vampire in the past and going through her life and figuring out how to live and what sustenance she needs and just getting used to the idea of not being able to die if she deserves to live etc and i find myself wanting to enjoy those chapters more but once we're in them i'm just kind of like let me get back to the current day or the 1980s storyline because that's the one that is much more interesting there's an actual like clear narrative and arc that we're following because she becomes a teacher and gets really involved with one of her students and becomes concerned for him and his family life because he comes to school and she interacts with his parents and she just gets a certain sense that things are not great so she becomes like more of a caretaker for him even outside of school they build this bond and there's this mystery going on involving this other person that he's mentioning who has died and she's trying to get to the bottom of that and also like what's going on at his home if the injuries that family members are sustaining are because they're in danger or what's going on and that storyline is five stars it's so good but it's not vampire-y like most of it there have been moments where she has to find blood and she has certain conversations about her immortality but it's more so in the past storylines where we get the vampire stuff and I feel like I want more vampire but then when we get to the vampire storyline I'm not loving it the same. It's all definitely interesting. I have been flying through the audiobook. I had to clean my entire house today like thoroughly clean like as if your landlord's coming over because maybe he is. So I listened to like three hours of the audiobook and I have it on double speed so I finish it in seven. And then I just listened to it on my drive into the city because I dropped Liam off with his grandparents because they really need an evening to turn my brain off from like parenting mode because it's just I'm not going to complain about like work and summertime because I work from home. I choose my own hours. Obviously it's great that I didn't have to put Liam into any other things this summer. Sorry I just keep looking at my lunch but it is hard to get work done when like every 20 minutes there's somebody who needs something and you want to make it like a fun summer and stuff so I just really needed the evening off and I treated myself to freshie. Look at this bowl the Oaxaca bowl. It's like avocado corn salsa tortilla chips lots of lettuce lime just good vibes and i actually have a live show in a couple hours with the channel besties where we're having an art night i don't know if i already told you that but i will flash on the screen the things that they were creating or they're going to create later tonight when we're together because i have them send it to me on instagram if you're somebody who's super creative and you want to join the membership i will plan another art night a couple months from now where we just like hang out for two hours and we accomplish our crafty goals 
it's like a little bit of chatting it's more just peaceful productivity time away from reading and then we also do reading sprints once or twice a month but i think i will end up finishing this just before the live show begins if i keep on the path that i'm on it was actually a good excuse to clean today because i am embarrassed to admit all of the books the 120 books that i had stacked next to my tv stand that were right here from the video you saw like a week or two ago now they were still here but today's the day i finally got them out of my house they are in my jeep now so still nearby but i will they, they will eventually leave and that'll be great i am so sleepy but my live show went so wonderfully everybody's so creative and i finished my book i'm giving it a four and i'm sad about my four um because i just feel like there's nothing worse than reading a book that you know could be a five like it had all the makings of being a five. Like Dead 11 last month, this is my new Dead 11. I feel like looking at this now, it doesn't even look like something that I would normally pick up. Like it is vampire-y and you're following this woman through many, many years and I've read stories like that before, but it's also just like slow, dense historical fiction at the same time. And I was grappling with my rating because I was like, this wasn't, like this really wasn't that exciting. But at the same time, it's absolutely gonna stick in my mind. This is a very memorable story. The writing, I guess is what it is, absolutely captivated me. I was interested at every single page, even though like nothing was really happening. I just looked on Goodreads and somebody said that it is as if you're reading Miss Honey from Matilda, who's just like spending time in her house and is like sad and lonely for hundreds of pages. Like that is really who she is. And nothing too dramatic really happens to her. Like it's not the kind of um, vampire lore that is fresh and new and exciting, but it's also not like classic. Like there really isn't that much. There, the God of Endings is this like, creature but that he's like that's not even much of the book and it's not about learning anything it's not like you get all of this background information and colette learns about the rules of vampirism and like finds her clan and like meets her enemies and there's all of these rules like she can't go out in the sun and she has to learn that she can't enter people's houses like it's literally nothing like that at all it's just all of a sudden she's immortal and then you're just following her through her mundane life. And she's just existing as best she can, trying to leave a positive impression behind, but she also lives with a lot of guilt and she has to constantly find food, obviously. So it was a little bit woman eating, it was a little bit Addie LaRue, but with a much more gothic nature and no romance. It's hard to pinpoint what didn't work for me. There were some like odd implications about motherhood and being childless that I don't know if like, I don't know what the goal really was with those or if I loved those that, that messaging. Maybe if it did have romance, that could have made it a five for me. Maybe if there was more tension somewhere, if there was a push and pull between like the dark side and the light side of this character. But that's just not what it was. Uh, let me grab all the books. I spent one week reading all of the things that I borrowed from the library and gave back. So I borrowed them again and completed my goals. A couple of them, brand new releases that have like a wait list. So I'm excited to have gotten to them so I don't have to re-reserve them, wait on the waiting list. Like I love reading stuff when it recently comes out and I can see what everyone else is thinking at the same time. These two were ones that I reserved and I was interested in in the moment. It was like planning them for different videos and they just didn't work out. So I'm glad I got to get to them. They also are pretty brand new releases. And then of course, the one that Liam recommended to me. And I liked everything here. Everything was between a three and a four. I don't have an all time new favorite. I didn't dislike anything. I love supporting my library. I love that I got to some of these cause they didn't fit into any other TBRs. So that's why it's fun to make kind of a side TBR just full of stuff I want to read. There's definitely more that has eluded me. I hope there's nothing that you really wanted me to read that I didn't get to that I mentioned at the beginning, but that's it for me today. And I'll see you in another one soon. Bye.